hppodcraft.com. Has produced this record from actual recordings made at sea. <laughs> During the winter of 1927 and 28, officials of the federal government made a strange and secret investigation of certain conditions in the ancient Massachusetts seaport of Innsmouth. The public first learned of it in February, when a vast series of raids and arrests occurred, followed by the deliberate burning and dynamiting, under suitable precautions, of an enormous number of crumbling, worm-eaten, and supposedly empty houses along the abandoned waterfront. Uninquiring souls let this occurrence pass as one of the major clashes in a spasmodic war on liquor. Keener news followers, however, wondered at the prodigious number of arrests, the abnormally large force of men used in making them, and the secrecy surrounding the disposal of the prisoners. No trials or even definite charges were reported, nor were any of the captives seen thereafter in the regular jails of the nation. There were vague statements about disease and concentration camps, and later about dispersal in various naval and military prisons, but nothing positive ever developed. Innsmouth itself was left almost depopulated, and is even now only beginning to show signs of a sluggishly revived existence. Complaints from many liberal organizations were met with long, confidential discussions, and representatives were taken on trips to certain camps and prisons. As a result, these societies became surprisingly passive and reticent. Newspaper men were harder to manage, but seemed largely to cooperate with the government in the end. Only one paper, a tabloid always discounted because of its wild policy, mentioned the deep-diving submarine that discharged torpedoes downward in the marine abyss just beyond Devil Reef. That item, gathered by chance in a haunt of sailors, seemed indeed rather far-fetched since the low black reef lies a full mile and a half out from Innsmouth Harbor. People around the country and in the nearby towns muttered a great deal among themselves, but said very little to the outer world. They had talked about dying and half-deserted Innsmouth for nearly a century, and nothing new could be wilder or more hideous than what they had whispered and hinted years before. Many things had taught them secretiveness, and there was now no need to exert pressure on them. Besides, they really knew very little. For wide salt marshes, desolate and unpeopled, keep neighbors off from Innsmouth on the landward side. But at last, I am going to defy the ban on speech about this thing. Results, I am certain, are so thorough that no public harm, save a shock of repulsion, could ever accrue from a hinting of what was found by those horrified raiders at Innsmouth. Besides, what was found might possibly have more than one explanation. I do not know just how much of the whole tale has been told even to me, and I have many reasons for not wishing to probe deeper. For my contact with this affair has been closer than that of any other layman, and I have carried away impressions which are yet to drive me to drastic measures. It was I who fled frantically out of Innsmouth in the early morning hours of July 16, 1927, and whose frightened appeals for government inquiry and action brought on the whole reported episode. I was willing enough to stay mute while the affair was fresh and uncertain. But now that it is an old story with public interest and curiosity gone, I have an odd craving to whisper about those few frightful hours in that ill-rumored and evilly shadowed seaport of death and blasphemous abnormality. The mere telling helps me to restore confidence in my own faculties to reassure myself that I was not simply the first to succumb to a contagious nightmare hallucination. It helps me, too, in making up my mind regarding a certain terrible step which lies ahead of me. We have just been listening to the opening paragraphs of The Shadow Over Innsmouth, a story by American weird fiction author H.P. Lovecraft. You are joining us here in the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. I am Chad Pfeiffer. And I'm Chris Lackey. And I'm Matt Parisi. Hey, we have a guest. Hey, Matt. (laughs) What'd you get on here? (laughs) Greetings, all. Uh, Some of you may remember Matt. He joined us some time ago as we went over the street. This is a bit of a better story than that one. (laughs) Oh, yes. So hopefully Matt's going to give us a little insight into maybe some other things that were going on in literature at this time. I'd be happy to do so. 
Matt, you have read this story. I have read the story, yes. Well, then we have an expert aboard. Actually, Matt, what's your new job now? What are you doing? I'm the executive director of the Penn Faulkner Foundation. All right. What does that mean? Uh, well, <laughs> the Penn Faulkner Foundation bestows a, a major prize in American fiction every year. And we have a celebrated Writers in the Schools program in Washington, D.C. And uh, we have a reading series at the Folger Shakespeare Library in D.C. A- any affiliation with the Esoteric Order of Dagon? Uh, very slight, but yes, they do our accounting for us. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was one of the services they offered. I should also mention that our reader today, and uh, for the entirety of the story, I think it'll take us a couple of episodes to cover, is Andrew Lehman, making his triumphant return. Yes, Andrew Lehman, who is one of the founders of the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society, one of our sponsors. That's right. And they have uh, some kind of Shadow Over Innsmouth merchandise, don't they? They do. Well, they have the Shadow Over Innsmouth part of their Dark Adventure Radio Theater. It's a, about an hour-long adaptation of the story, and it's phenomenal. It uh, has, as the main character, Character, Matt Foyer, who you've heard on the show and, and seen in films. He does a, a great mm-hmm. job as the, as the protagonist of the story. It's it's really great. It's really great. Well, that intro to this story that we just heard is pretty lengthy, but it's so cool and it, it so, you know, foreshadows so much of what happens. I just wanted to make sure we got it all in there. Yeah. And, I, you know, I have to say, I, and I don't think I've blown this phrase before in any of our shows, but this, this right here is my favorite H.P. Lovecraft story. I'm not going to say that. No? No. What's your favorite? I don't know yet. Maybe it'll change after we've gone through the entire series, but but this is the one, man. I mean, it's got everything. It's got all the Lovecraftian tropes. It's got all the ancient history stuff. It's got the monsters, and it's genuinely scary. Yeah, it's pretty creepy. The first time I read this, the whole thing where he's in the hotel and there's people trying to get in the door. I mean, I don't want to spoil anything. We'll get to it, but that stuff gave me chills, and it's pretty rare with Lovecraft. I mean, he is a weird fiction author. There's a creepiness to it, but this one I actually kind of felt a little nervous and scared while I was reading it. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great one. I, it's one of his best, in, in my opinion. I love it. And so let's yeah. just let's get into the story. Sure. So what do we know from the opening? Part of the town was blown up by the feds? There was supposedly, yeah, it was a war on some, there was some raid because they thought it was a, some kind of bootlegging uh, mm-hmm. operation that was going on over there. Uh, a bunch of men were arrested, and then they were never seen again. No trials yeah. or anything. Uh, some human rights folks showed up to try and see what the heck was going on. Then they kind of took them away, and then those people left, didn't say anything about it, didn't yeah. bring it up anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Which is super cool. I, I thought this might be the first time I've ever seen it in literature where the, there's clear, there's a supernatural conspiracy. I mean, the government is aware that mythos stuff is going on at this point. The American government, which is pretty incredible. I mean, Doyle has some of that stuff and, and uh, the Sherlock Holmes stories. But this is the first time where I've, I've seen it in supernatural literature where the government is aware of this. I mean, they clearly know something's going on that's pretty creepy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't off the top of my head, I can't think of anything else that's had sort of this government a covert war with an extraterrestrial. Well, I mean, I guess they're not extraterrestrial, but they're an alien species that live under the ocean. Matt's got a great point. When I first read this, it starts with a huge explosion, sky full of smoke, which Lovecraft's <laughs> done before. You know, he, he did that in Rats in the Walls. And, and again, it's the same kind of compelling thing where the narrator starts by telling you, okay, I tell you about this place. By the way, it's just been blown up because there's something terrible there. But then with the submarine going down and, and, and launching torpedoes beneath Devil's Reef, that means that they not only, they didn't just say, okay, there's weird stuff, let's just wipe it out. They understand that there's more to it, that there's something down there yeah. that they have to take care of. Yeah, they got concentration camps. It sort of made me think of the end of Watchmen, actually, because they had that section about the tabloid where only one tabloid published the truth and nobody could believe them because they were full of wild theories. I don't know if you guys remember the end of Watchmen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what is the, I love, Yeah, it's just the one. I assume it's the, uh, the Weekly World News is the one tabloid that believes this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> They're the ones that are always publishing the truth about Bat Boy and, and that kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. Now, the protagonist of the story, his name is Robert Olmsted, and it's not in the story, actually. It's never spoken, but in Lovecraft's notes, he named this character. He named him Robert Olmsted. Bobby O. Yep. (laughs) Okay, so we can call him Robert, even though that's not actually in the story. That's interesting. So that first six paragraphs gives you a sketch of what the whole story is going to be and, and what to expect. It's really effective. And then we get into the real story when he says, I never heard of Innsmouth till the day before I saw it for the first and... So far, last time. Yeah. I thought it was a very nice, concise sentence. It's a great introduction. It's a good first sentence for Lovecraft, I think. Right. Does, does, you know, it just sounds like the great beginning of an adventure. And basically, we learn that Robert here is celebrating his coming of age with a tour of New England. Now, see me, I would think somebody his age, you know, fresh out of out of college, would probably be hitting Cancun. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe Miami or even the Jersey Shore. Yeah, the Jersey Shore, right. Well, (laughs) Something going on a genealogical and architectural tour seems to be um, 
it, well, it just says a lot about this guy's character. This is basically the Lovecraft replacement narrator. It's him, really. Yeah, it is. The main character here has habits that Lovecraft had in his personal life. His plan is to go from Newburyport, which is a real place, to Arkham, Arkham being a fictional place. On this tour, he's always trying to find the cheapest way possible. Chris, you were telling me you're reading a life right now, right? I am. This I is am, something yeah. that, that Lovecraft actually did when he went on. Track. Yeah, it was. It's interesting. I was reading about him going down to this this summer before he wrote this story. He was just mm-hmm. going down to Florida and uh, Savannah, Georgia, and a bunch of places. You know, stopping on the way, meeting with friends that he's met through correspondence. But um, one of his tricks to help save money was to book all of his buses at night. So when he traveled, he would just sleep on the bus instead of having to book a hotel. Wow. Ingenious. And he was going yeah, to, <laughs> that, <laughs> that summer, he went down to, to Key West, which was really far south. And he was going to go to Havana, but just couldn't afford to make the trip down there. But he really, really wanted to go because it's, you know, such a, an old town. And, and that's everything that Lovecraft is just obsessed with. Every town he comments on is the architecture and how old it is. And if it's a modern town, he just doesn't like it and he won't even bother with it. And this is 1931 that he's 1931. doing this? 1931, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's around the same time that, that Hemingway's down there or around that, that period. That is. Uh, he goes to Key West on the 11th of June, 1931. Lovecraft does. Lovecraft does. And that's where he met Hemingway. He met, <laughs> he met Hemingway? <laughs> yeah. I... He, you know, he did meet Hemingway, but they didn't actually know each other. As writers. No, no. Well, so I did a piece of fan fiction <laughs> <laughs> where they met. Basically, what happens is, you know, Lovecraft gets into town. He follows this cat, which takes him to Hemingway's residence. And then the, there's a bunch of cats and they take him up to the moon to watch a boxing match together. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't published it. Why not? Yeah, it's just on my hard drive. The terrible old man in the sea. <laughs> this whole story seems to be kind of a a a warring tale against thrift because it's this kind of uh, cheap skatiness that gets our narrator into intimate to begin with so if he had just paid for the better train ticket or the better bus ticket we wouldn't have a story here yeah, but I mean, it's not it's not just that. It's the, the fact that he's never heard of this, of, of Innsmouth, and he is interested, especially being a, an antiquarian. He wants right. to know more about this. Like, wait a minute. I know this area. Why have I never heard of this town? And as people yeah. start to tell him, as the, as the ticket seller starts to tell him about it, he just gets really fascinated. Right, because it's a ticket seller who says, well, look, if you want, he says, I need to get to Arkham. I want to do it cheap. He says, well, if you really want to do it the cheap way, you can take the Innsmouth bus. Starts here goes through Innsmouth, ends up in Arkham. But people don't really like it. Only There's only a few people ever on the bus. Mm-hmm. But like you say, the narrative says, well, well, tell me about it. So what does he tell him about Innsmouth? What do we learn about this? Well, he tells him it was a big port town um, before the War of 1812. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the train never actually ended up going through there. Uh, the town is based mostly off fishing and lobstering. And they have a small gold refinery. Now, the, the town's really gone to hell in the last hundred years. Like you oh, said, yeah. at one point, it was probably... Had you know, it was an up and comer because of the, the good trading they did there in the, in the fish. But the only thing that's really left is the old refinery that was set up at one point. And old man Marsh owns it. And old man Marsh, he's got some kind of skin disease or deformity or something, so he doesn't he doesn't get out much. But he's the grandson of this guy, Captain Obed Marsh, mm-hmm. who was uh, kind of a businessman. And yeah, he's he, the one that founded the refinery, right? He founded the refinery exactly. You know, he was a captain, so he'd go sail out to the South Sea, and they would bring in a lot of foreign people from the South Seas into Innsmouth. Right, and people don't like that. I mean, people well, people like in general, they, they say that he made a bargain with the devil oh, when yeah. he was out there in the South Pacific. He brought imps out of hell to live in Innsmouth. And they said there was some kind of sacrifice happened. Yeah, there was devil worshipping and sacrifices that were made in 1845 that some people Yeah, that really marks when out. things went to hell in Innsmouth, right? 1845, yeah. that's it's like past that date and everything's bad. Right. Yeah, because then there's a big plague, right? That The ticket right. clerk actually knows a surprising amount about it. <laughs> he does. <laughs> I know, my favorite is he says, look, people whisper about this place, but I'm from Panton, Vermont, and that kind of story don't go down with me. However, I'm going to tell you some shit anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god! Why? It's just like the the dreams in the witch house. It's like the way this guy describes the place. Why on earth would you ever go there? He's like they're they're like what they call white trash down south. They're full of they're lawless and sly and full of secret things. And then he tells him that sometimes people vanish in Innsmouth. But yeah, you know, 
a day trip wouldn't hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's the supernatural stuff too. There's this devil reef just off the coast. Right. Which it, it's above water sometimes, it's below water depending on the tide. And there's a story that a bunch of devils can be seen up on there, sprawled out, sunning themselves sometimes. They love it. Coming in and out of caves. And people think that, that maybe Captain Marsh, well, Captain Marsh would sail out to Devil's Reef, the uh-huh. old, old Captain Marsh, and maybe he found some pirate loot out there. And that's what the gold for the refinery comes from. But it would have to be an awful lot of pirate loot because he's been doing it for a long time. Yeah, there's there's an inexhaustible source of pirate loot out there. (laughs) They dig it up. Pirates come and put more in. They just keep, you know, hitting the pirate loot. Now, this is all, of course, 1845, 1846. That's when those riots happened that mattered. Well, yeah. First, it was a disease, supposedly, that happened. And a a lot of people died from it. After people were dying, some riots happened. And then just the population never came back. Right. There's only about three or 400 people there yeah, now, he has to Exactly. This guy knows populations, too. He's a very informed station agent. Yeah. Well, then there's a great paragraph there. He says, reason that people feel this way, look, it's just race prejudice. I thought it was interesting when he said that. Huh. But then he goes, not not saying that I blame him. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you were saying, Chris, they brought those New England ships, they bring people in from Africa, Asia, all over the place. And then he says, uh, probably heard about that Salem man that came home with a Chinese wife. I just imagine that happened a little more frequently that the whole New England area wouldn't know about it. You you must know about the one guy in Salem who brought home a Chinese wife. <laughs> I guess it just didn't happen very often back then. People wouldn't do it. But he does say, he says, God knows they've gotten to be about as bad as South Sea cannibals and Guinea savages. Yeah. The racism is, is definitely here in this story. And, and the themes of it are pretty... Uh, typical for for Lovecraft's story, you know, there's kind of hints of Arthur German in here, and um, the lurking fear, maybe. the lurking fear. Well, yeah, because who, whoever these people are in Innsmouth, they've been tainted somehow, yeah, by some kind of weird crossbreeding. The station agent describes this Innsmouth look they all have. He says, "There certainly is a strange kind of streak in the Innsmouth folks today. I don't know how to explain it, but it sort of makes you crawl. You'll notice a little in Sergeant if you take his bus." Some of them have queer, narrow heads with flat noses and bulgy, starey eyes that never seem to shut. And their skin ain't quite right. Rough and scabby, and the sides of their necks are all shriveled and creased up. Get bald, too, very young. The older fellows look the worst. Fact is, I don't believe I've ever seen a very old chap of that kind. Guess they must die of looking in the glass. Animals hate them. They used to have lots of horse trouble before autos came in. Sergeant that he's referring to, there's a bus driver that's going to be yeah. picking him up. I like his joke about them dying from looking in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> he also mentions that the Innsmouth people are kind of standoffish. And, uh, you know, they even though people don't like them, they don't really want to mix with people either. And that there are always a lot of fish in Innsmouth Harbor. Yeah. Other places are having trouble with fish, but... You know, here it's almost as if Aquaman it's lived fish. there. <laughs> and there's a hotel, the Gilman House. The Gilman says, House. You, you, yeah, you probably shouldn't stay there, though. Yes. Uh, he, had, the, he had a friend the, that stayed there or something? It was a factory inspector that went into town. They stayed the whole night, but he kept hearing talking. Even though the hotel was empty, he heard people in the other rooms, and he didn't get any sleep because they were talking, and he couldn't understand what language they were speaking in. Which makes me wonder, how, how does such a business stay afloat? I, <laughs> Who visits the Gilman Hotel like on yeah. a regular basis? Do the deep ones go and stay there for, for the night or whatever? I don't, I don't know. Maybe they're all just subsidized by the uh, refinery so that they just have a hotel in town. Mm-hmm to keep up appearances? I guess so, yeah. The mini bar charges are ridiculous. That's how they say it. <laughs> when that guy that stayed there, Casey, when he, he, yeah, he stayed the night in his clothes, you know, he didn't even want to touch the sheets. When he inspected the refinery, it was also in pretty bad shape. Nobody really knows where the gold comes from. And he mentions also that the women in Innsmouth wear really odd jewelry. Yeah, they say they think it's foreign jewelry that uh, the yeah. sailors bring in and things like that. But some people also think it still might be pirate treasure. So, there, you know, there's a couple more facts you get here. He makes, like Matt said, he makes reference to white trash down in the south. That's something we haven't heard since Beyond the Wall of Sleep, the white trash. And, you know, he says the government and the census men always have a hard time out in Innsmouth. And one guy that was out there went crazy. Somebody who visited and is in an institution in Danvers. And that's basically it. That's, that's the information he gives him. He's not going to go there tonight. He decides he's going to spend the night in Newburyport and then grab the bus in the morning, yeah. hang out during the day and, and check things out and then take the, the late bus out so he never has to stay there. Right? Yeah, first Robbie goes on over to the uh, Newport Public Library 
just mm-hmm. to find out about Innsmouth because he's get super curious about right. it. Right, and here we get a, another a number of other facts, and we get to uh, we get to see the the tiara, right? The uh, well, no, no, the, he goes over he, from the library. He gets sent over to the historical society. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, he he gets uh, well. He does some uh, research in the library. Yeah, and, he finds uh, out that Innsmouth was founded in 1643, and it started mm-hmm. it was a, a shipping town. It started off. Yeah, that's basically it. There was, yeah. you know, everything was crappy after 1846. Some Poles and some Portuguese tried to settle there after the Civil War, but they were scattered in some terrible way. And mm-hmm. lots of references to, saint, to strange jewelry. It says there's some samples at Miskatonic University of the jewelry and mm-hmm. one in the display room right here in town with the Historical Society. Mm-hmm. So from the librarian, he gets a note of introduction to Miss Anna Tilton, who's the Historical Society mm-hmm. person. She's perfectly pleasant old lady, and she says, yeah, okay, I'll take you over there. And she takes him to the Histor- Historical Society, lets him in. There's all kinds of stuff there, but he's really interested in the, uh, the sample of the jewelry in the corner. It took no excessive sensitiveness to beauty to make me literally gasp at the strange, unearthly splendor of the alien, opulent fantasy that rested there on a purple velvet cushion. Even now, I can hardly describe what I saw though it was clearly enough a sort of tiara, as the description had said. It was tall in front and with a very large and curiously irregular periphery, as if designed for a head of almost freakishly elliptical outline. The longer I looked, the more the thing fascinated me. And in this fascination there was a curiously disturbing element hardly to be classified or accounted for. At first I decided that it was the queer otherworldly quality of the art which made me uneasy. However, I soon saw that my uneasiness had a second and perhaps equally potent source residing in the pictorial and mathematical suggestions of the strange designs. The patterns all hinted of remote secrets and unimaginable abysses in time and space, and the monotonously aquatic nature of the reliefs became almost sinister. Among these reliefs were fabulous monsters of abhorrent grotesqueness and malignity, half ichthyic and half batrachian in suggestion, which one could not dissociate from a certain haunting and uncomfortable sense of pseudo-memory, as if they called up some image from deep cells and tissues whose retentive functions are wholly primal and awesomely ancestral. At times I fancied that every contour of these blasphemous fish frogs was overflowing with the ultimate quintessence of unknown and inhuman evil. That is not a Miss America tiara. (laughs) (laughs) What is it says half ichthyic and half Batrachian? Ichthyic is fish. And Batrachian is that is that frog? That would make sense because then he calls them blasphemous fish frogs. This is so weird, man. Yeah, this is, but this is sort of like that section in at the Mountains of Madness where he sees the reliefs and it, it captures the imagination. This story of this told through art of this ancient society. I found a little interesting about the modern because he does say something in there about modernism. He comments on modernism when he says all the other art objects I had ever seen either belonged to some known racial or national stream or else were consciously modernistic defiances of every recognized stream. This tiara was neither. Hmm. It's interesting to me because, uh, you know, in art around this time, you have Pablo Picasso and Salvador Dali working in that period. I I don't know. I found it a very astute comment on modernism, that modernism was basically just a reaction. And it was still within the bounds of that old Western tradition, but just reacting to it, which was kind of interesting. You mentioned this time and what was going on. When was this story written? This 1931, right? Yeah. Isn't Mm -hmm. that when? Yeah. Oh, it was published later, right? 1935. uh But it was written in the, the end of the year of 31. Yeah, it was published later. It was actually, I, it was published later. I think this is the first and only uh, Lovecraft story that was published outside of a of a magazine or anthology, right? Right, right. And this is a this is a really 1931. It's a very robust and diverse period of American literature. And this is really an age of giants that he's writing in. Eliot's writing Ash Wednesday in that year. E. Cummings is writing Marianne Moore and William Carlos Williams. The Harlem Renaissance is going on. So there's people like Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes. I think this is the year Sinclair Lewis wins the Nobel Prize in 1931. Faulkner's at the height of his powers. Fitzgerald is still publishing stories. John Dos Passos. Hemingway publishes uh, Farewell to Arms in 1929. Uh, There's all sorts of enormous literature, uh, enormous literary figures going on. I mean, in popular literature, Dashiell Hammett, The Maltese Falcon, is published in this year. Edgar Rice Burroughs is writing. Agatha Christie and Ellery Queen are writing. 
uh, and Robert E. Howard is just starting to publish stories, and his his first book is published in the following year, I think, The Phoenix and the Sword. Is that a Conan mm-hmm. book? The Phoenix and the Sword is a Conan story. Yeah, that's right. Uh, right. Okay, so that's published in the following year. And then James Kane uh-huh. is coming out. And then the theater, you've got people like Brecht and Thornton Wilder, Eugene O'Neill, and uh, George Bernard Shaw, although his best years are behind him, sort of. I'm probably getting in trouble for saying that. But, uh, whoa. <laughs> whoa, whoa, dude. Hey, Not Brizzy. cool. But so this is the height of modernism, and everything is going on at the same time. So Lovecraft's writing the story. Well, I believe that this is an example, and I've already said it, but this is one of the best examples of Lovecraft's work because of its just inherent readability. You mentioned that this has some similarities to At the Mountains of Madness, where we're learning about a culture through its art. It's similar to that, but some people have said that this is maybe an overlong story, but I really don't think so, and I, I no. have full interest the whole time. And when he's describing these things, it's not like At the Mountains of Madness, where it's it's so long and involved that I kind of feel myself drifting off i'm just riveted the whole time especially in this opening thing i mean it's just suggesting everything it doesn't show you anything yet you're so excited for him to get there yeah what i'm interested in the story is it's amazing how much of this story is told i mean the you have the story from the ticket agent that goes on for a long time and then you have the story the zadok story which is a a large yeah the grocery clerk tells some stuff too the whole story is other people most of the story is other people telling you things that happened at innsmouth which i think is the most fascinating part of the story the the action sequence is great but I, I like the suggestion of all the bad things that are happening that these other people may or may not know about. It's good stuff. He asked how they got this tiara. It was pawned by a guy back in 1873, and then that dude was killed in a brawl a few days later. And then that mm-hmm. pawn company uh, sold it to the to the historical society. So Tilden thinks that it was actually found by, it was pirate treasure that was from East Indian or Indo-Chinese origin. Yeah, it's some kind of pirate booty. And that's that's kind of her explanation for it. Yeah. And she's disgusted with Innsmouth because, in her opinion, it's just slid down the cultural, cultural scale. Especially since uh, this esoteric order of Dagon has showed up right. in Innsmouth. And she just says, oh, yeah, it's this total quasi-pagan thing that is from the Far East. And it's it's kind of stuck around because once the fishing got good again, Captain Marsh attributed it to these old gods. Yeah, they, I mean, the, the whole town has a sort of religious cult. Yeah. So after he finds all this stuff out from Miss Tilton... He's crashing at the YMCA. Well, he goes to bed all crazy, his head filled with all kind of speculations. He's very excited to get yeah. to Innsmouth, and he's ready for his trip the next day. In the morning, our protagonist hangs out at Hammond's drugstore, and the bus shows up. Mm-hmm. There's only three passengers in there looking pretty rough. And yeah. they shamble out of the bus and they and off down the street. What do you think those guys are up to? Right? They're they're clearly <laughs> they're commuting in from Innsmouth. <laughs> yeah. Gotta make the donuts glub glub glub. <laughs> I mean they have jobs in town, right? That's why they're there. Yes, so yeah. I mean, or maybe they're just sightseeing. It's a nice town. <laughs> <laughs> There's a wonderful historical society there. Yeah. I just imagine the bus opens up and out comes Steve Buscemi, Don Knotts, and Tori Spelling. <laughs> <laughs> there, was a, there was a kind of a thing going around on our forums about people who have that Innsmouth look. Oh, right, yeah. Shelley Duvall's one of them, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And that guy, oh, what's his name? I can never remember his name. He's sort of, uh, he's got an Italian-sounding name. Yeah, the guy from Cuckoo's Nest? Yeah, and he was in Ghost. Yeah, uh, it's the crazy subway ghost. I mean, he just has that Innsmouth look, you know, totally. Yeah. Uh, among people who have the Innsmouth look are Joe Sargent, the driver of that bus, who's maybe around 35. He's wearing some shabby clothes, a golf cap. He makes references to deep creases he has in his neck. Yeah, which make him seem older. Yeah, it says... Uh, when the driver came out of the store, I looked at him more carefully and tried to determine the source of my evil impression. He was a thin, stoop-shouldered man, not much under six feet tall, dressed in shabby blue civilian clothes and wearing a frayed gray golf cap. His age was perhaps 35, but the odd, deep creases in the sides of his neck made him seem older when one did not study his dull, expressionless face. He had a narrow head, bulging, watery blue eyes that seemed never to wink, a flat nose, a receding forehead and chin, and singularly undeveloped ears. His long, thick lip and coarse-poured grayish cheeks seemed almost beardless, except for some sparse yellow hairs that straggled and curled in irregular patches. And in places, the surface seemed queerly irregular, as if peeling from some cutaneous disease. His hands were large and heavily veined, and had a very unusual grayish-blue tinge. The fingers were strikingly short in proportion to the rest of the structure, and seemed to have a tendency to curl closely into the huge palm. As he walked toward the bus, I observed his 
peculiarly shambling gait, and saw that his feet were inordinately immense. The more I studied them, the more I wondered how he could buy any shoes to fit them. That's a disgusting guy. My favorite line of his description is the next one where he says, a certain greasiness about the fellow increased my dislike. (laughs) Yeah. And he smelled. He smelled like fish. Mm. And now the narrator, he looks at him and he's just going, I can't figure out, because he's not Asiatic, he's not Polynesian, he's not Negroid. Something about him. Well, hey, for a mere 60 cents, you get a ride on a bus all alone with this guy. Yeah. Which he does. He boards the bus and they take off. And it's funny, he makes some comment about how people don't look at the bus as it goes or they pretend not to. Yeah. I thought that was a cool little sentence. It's sort of how, you know, sometimes you'll see somebody that's maybe got something a little weird about him. And, you know, you don't want to look at him to call attention to it, but you can't help looking out of the corner right. of your eye. That's sort of the uh, the attitude of the people in Newburyport. Right, yeah. Well, the journey that they take from there to Innsmouth is described. He doesn't get too architectural about it. It's a really great kind of passage with him going on the bus to Innsmouth. It's not overly done. I think it kind of contributes to the degraded atmosphere of the story. It actually, yeah. to me, it kind of increases the dread, makes you... A little, you can see the countryside kind of going downhill as you get there. Yeah. Increasingly decayed and destitute. And he passes Plum Island, which is mentioned in um, The Silence of the Lambs. Oh, really? Yeah. They oh. want to send Hannibal Lecter to Plum Island Correctional Facility. Man, I'm never going to this part of America. It sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Just fishmen and serial killers. Well, they pass Kingsport as well, and he makes reference to yeah, the, uh, the Strange High House in the Mist. And then uh, they rattle on for a while, and finally they arrive. At Innsmouth, and that might be a good place for us to stop this episode. Yeah, I think that's a good place. We can delve into the uh, the fishy, strange, decrepit town of Innsmouth as we jump into this next week. Matt, are you going to be able to get in with us again? I'd love to, yeah, if you guys will have. Yes, absolutely. It's going to be awesome. Well, uh, a couple of things to mention. We want to thank uh, Mike Mann once again for helping us on the tech side. Yep. Brooke Burgess, who provided some notes for us on this story as well. And Andrew Lehman for taking us through massive amounts of text and making it seem easy. Yeah, he's a champ. I just want to say, uh, again, thanks to our sponsor, the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society. You can find out more about them at CthulhuLives.org. Yeah, and I want to thank all of the donors who helped us to get uh, meet our ransom. I, I hope you enjoyed the readings that we put out last week. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we don't have any specific promotions going on right now, but we do need to pay the rent on the show. So if you yes. have a couple of loose bucks, uh, feel free to send them our way. We Please do. From you. Well, Matt, thanks so much for being with us today, for, for lending some expertise. We look forward to talking to you again next week. Thanks so much, guys. And with that, I'm Chris Lackey. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. I'm Matt Barisi. And this has been the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. HPPodcraft.com. <laughs> Sorry. Podcraft.com has produced this record from actual recordings made at sea. <laughs>